Welcome to Mapping the Self. I'm Selena Garofino. Know thyself was carved into stone at the entrance of Apollo's temple at Delphi in ancient Greece. Scholars, poets, philosophers have debated the big questions around what it is to know yourself for thousands of years. I invite you to join me for conversations with artists, creators, scholars, spiritual teachers, writers, and humans of all walks of life to discuss these big questions together, to engage in a dialogue around what it is to live fully, to map ourselves, to know ourselves, to grow our compassion and listening, and to explore together our highest possibilities. Welcome. I am so honored to welcome one of my teachers, Abby Galvin, to the show today. Abby is the owner of The Studio, a wonderful yoga studio in downtown. Well, not downtown, but it's in New York City. I won't try to. It's downtown. It's downtown, downtown. right? I can say downtown. Okay. I was like, I'm calling myself out as not being a New Yorker by labeling (laughs) it incorrectly. (laughs) No, no, you're good. Perfect. The studio, as it says on the website, is where your teacher goes to practice. And it is true. Uh, Abby is an absolute genius. I almost wanted to read your bio because it's so beautifully written, but I'll put it in the show notes instead. Great. I feel like if I read your bio, the episode could be over. (laughs) It's already got all the information. Um, So Abby, this podcast is called Mapping the Self and I would love for you to talk because it's something I hear you speak about a lot in class and in your trainings about how it is that we construct ourselves. Um, Okay, well, that's a huge question. I know. (laughs) Because that is basically the entire practice. Yes, it is. Right, and so what we use as a guide for all of us is what we would use as a guide in life. We use maps Mm -hmm. and templates. So we make our body into the container to hold the elixir, to hold currency, energy, information. Um, And then we divide and conquer because it's easy to um, uh, organize something and live in it well when it is, Um, organized by sections when it's divided into its parts so that each piece of you is a fractal of every other piece of you Mm -hmm. while you are more than the sum of your parts. And that's why we use um, uh, the metaphors of things that have parts and units and measure. Because if you look at your body as a house, well, we've got a basement floor, which is the pelvis, and we have the middle floor, which is the uh, the living quarters of your house, and we have the head, which is like the cupola or the rooftop. Or we can look at your body as a car, where we can look at the function of the glands by virtue of what a car does, because a car needs lots of things in order to make it go. And just as your body, all of the glandular work is your hormones in your emotional life. It changes your chemistry. So we divide that up just like your um, perineum is going to be like how you put the key in the ignition and your adrenals are going to be like the tires and how you put uh, air in them and how you rotate them and organize them like your chassis. And then one um, level up from there is going to be your spleen pancreas. That's how you put gas in your tank and thoughts in your head. And then one gland up is going to be your um, then it's going to be your thyroid gland, which is like uh, your temperature gauge, your metabolism, your control mechanism. Then one gland up is going to be your pituitary, which is your how you organize your mirrors and the angles of what you can see and what you can't see and where you're blindsided and your 360 degree vision. And then your pineal gland, which is your antenna. And then finally your thymus gland, which is the steering wheel, because it's very hard to well, it's impossible to change the direction of your life when you don't have your health. Yes. The, one of the most important things that I've heard from you recently that was really um, a big shift for me was that it's never about going straight because you'll run into a blockade. It's finding the middle. Right. Yes. Many people are taught that the virtue is in being straight, but being straight is eventually rigid. Mm -hmm. What you really want to do is get around your obstacles. What you really want to do is get to where you want to go. What you really want to do is learn the techniques of reading a map and driving territory rather than think that you're going to be straight. 
because straight eventually has an edge. And when you're edgy, you're going to fall off a cliff or you're going to have an angle. And eventually there should be no angles and there's no straight lines in our body. There's no straight lines in nature. Yeah. And all routes have twists and turns and hills and valleys, just like our body and also just like our life, right? There's no straight line. Nobody, nobody has the metaphor of a straight line in life. There's always, it's more like a Mobius strip. Yes. And the straight line only comes when you're in tension and you're hammering at something that isn't working. I was listening to Dr. Lisa Miller speaking about how when you're panicked and your chemistry is spiking, how the vision gets very narrow and your vision um, goes what they call dorsal to ventral. So you're looking from above below and it gets super narrow and panicked and you're hammering at a red door and trying to move a chess piece that is immovable. Mm -hmm. And how when you widen the aperture of the mind and get a broader vision, the vision goes from the ground of being up and it opens up your capacity to see other options and possibilities. And when she was speaking, I was all I could think about was things that you have taught me about the ground of being, being the support for the vision and how we need things to be more spherical because when we're in a line, it's too narrow. Right. And, you know, any kind of line, our job is not to drive the line, it's to reference the line. Mm. So even when we are looking at how to line something up or be well measured, it's still just a reference. It's not, um, it's not rigid. So, you know, many people learn yoga in a very linear, rigid way, which is fine, but eventually you have to move out of the the rigidity of correctness and into the fluency of the imagination. Mm -hmm. There's no transformation unless something really has fluency, much like conjugating a verb. So we don't speak like when you only know one, um, you know, one way to say something like in a beginning language class, it's very, your, your um, expression is very limited and it's very rigid But eventually when you conjugate a verb and you have all sorts of other ways to say things, when you have verb tenses, you can reference timing, you can reference intentions. So all of a sudden, um, language becomes fuller. And that really is the same in our practice. Once you start conjugating verbs, once you get more, in other words, dimensional, voluminous, all of a sudden you have something that looks like the imagination engaging in the practice because yes. there is no, right. There's no real expression, articulation or exploration without imagination. And that's why, uh, you know, just to follow a teacher or to follow a guru or give it away to Jesus becomes very linear. It's either you're right or you're wrong or you're good and you're bad, but instead it's everything around you. Also, it makes things much more hopeful because uh, if you use, uh, you know, if you use more dimension, then you're really playing with the imagination in the body, which is vibration. You know, anytime the mind or the imagination enters the body, we have so much more vibration. And then you're playing with nature. And when you're playing with nature, nature is so generous and it will always give you a way out. It will always give you um, ways to uh, mitigate against injury, pain, um, uh, uh, falling into yourself, collapsing, being sick. It always gives you a way out. Yes. That's also beautifully said. It's what has attracted me to the practice of Katona Yoga and to you as a teacher Mm -hmm. is that life is very, very complex. And we often like to reduce things and make them simple because it feels safe, but it's not safe. And Mm -hmm. complexity is deeply nourishing to our neurology and to our tissues and really to the whole of who we are. And when you get out of that line, it opens you up to the complexity and the possibility. And there you can develop real technique, which does create conditions of safety as you have taught me. Right. So if you think of what complexity is, think of this, think of like knitting a row of yarn and you knit one row and you think, oh, it's great. Well, it's linear. And then you knit another row. It's only when you knit and interweave uh, 10 million rows, do you get a sweater? Yes. It takes so much to do one thing. And that's why we always say, if you want one thing, you have to do everything. Mm-hmm. And if you do everything, you might get one thing. 
but it's all been worth it because along the way you will have picked up um, the dimensionality of effort, of hitting a goal, of making a goal, of moving from the personal into something that is archetypal, which is good technique. So all of that is so um, hopeful and doable. It is. And that's why this practice in a way is so advanced. You know, you can learn to do a a handstand, a freestanding handstand and do all these things. And if it's too physical, there's no space for the imaginative. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about this practice, you know, I remember the first time I came to the studio, I've been doing yoga since I was 12 years old, I'm 40. And I was sweating and working so hard Mm -hmm. and just dying. And I'm looking around the room and people are just moving with such ease through this practice. And I was like, I'm in good shape. Why can't I do this? And it was a different technique and I had to learn it. And I remember the day that I found the crease in my hip in my home practice and found the fold and Mm. suddenly could be there without my quad screaming. And then the imagination popped and I was able to start magic squaring and breathing and make this expansive practice and the aha happened. And it was such a cool thing. And I remind my students all the time now who are on this practice path and Mm, that, you know, stage one is just trying to find the physicality of it. And once that is there and the fold is right and the pieces come together, everything else kind of floods in and you can be more imaginative in the shapes. And in that way, that's why this practice, I think, is so advanced. Well, actually, we should not look at it that way because Ooh, tell then, me. because then people will find it too inaccessible. And mm. what I find so accessible about our practice is what I tell all of the teachers that are just starting, like, where do I start? You know, after they've had so much information and all of this uh, new kind of um, working with metaphors. And the first thing that anybody should do, which all of us can do, is measure. Mm -hmm. So if you get on your hands and knees and you turn your hands towards each other and those third fingers um, touch and then you turn your hands out, your hands should be right under your shoulders. They should they should find the width across the collarbones so that, you know, your two fists are the size of your brain and your two wrists around your neck and your your neck around twice as your waist. So we are designed to fit. And mm-hmm. if you start to measure, it's not about feeling good or not feeling good or finding this or finding that. It is just using the right measure. And you'll find um, so many new ways of working because it'll be easier than making effort that uses personal effort to find the right muscle or the right move. Yes. Or something yeah. that feels right or that unfortunately feels uh, familiar. Right. But in the beginning, like when you're measuring, if you have muscular imbalances or things, sometimes stuff won't go where it's supposed to go or where it fits. I'm not articulating that very well. Yeah. But that's good information. Yes. Right. Because that tells you, oops, I I don't fit. What's, what's wrong here? Something must be up. The body will, you know, poses show things. Yeah. They show your technique. So we can see like, oh, for 10 years, you know, you've been using your, uh, overusing your uh, left side and not your right side at all. Or for 10 years, you're sitting on one piece of your foot. Well, poses show things. They show how you fold yourself, how you fit yourself. And that's why to use information that's not you is so um, useful. That's why we always say, use a map, use a musical score, use a formula, use a recipe, Use a clock, use something that's not personal, but that is formal so that you can conform and in so doing, you change. Yes. And you do. I mean, I have to say, I I Mm. just continue to, I'm going to let the siren go by. The sounds of New York City. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In my own practice, yeah, that's better. It's it's totally fine. In my own practice, what I found is that through the repetition, which you speak about all the time, as I continued to just measure it up and measure it up, it resolved itself. The disorganization, the things that were holding me from being able to fit myself resolved themselves with daily practice. The change came. Right, exactly. So time 
technique and repetition is what sort of like the big ingredients are. How, and, how does a student stay committed to practice? Because I hear from students, I've taught yoga for a very long time, and I know what my personal answer was. For me, it was ritualizing routine so that mm-hmm. it didn't become mundane mm-hmm. and boring. Uh, but I hear from students a lot, you know, people date yoga, they practice for a while, they have big shifts in the beginning, and it feels really magical. But when they hit some kind of plateau where they're not seeing the growth happen so quickly, that's often I have found when students drop their practice, mm-hmm. when it's not as exciting. So what what do you have to say about practice and staying committed to practice? Well, you know, just like in life, you have to know when to go in and when to come out. And yoga should be should have the, the both components of of practicing communally and learning from one another and having a home practice. And home practice is not for beginners, but but what what people do for a long time before they're ready to really have a home practice is that you learn in um, you learn in reflection with other people. And that's why you don't do yoga in the mirror, because it's a false reflection, because your right hand is still your right hand. So you're just looking at yourself with all your habits and all your damage and all your compensatory skills. Mm. But when you learn with other people, you have a reference and you have a reflection. It's just like, you know, that's why it's, you know, that's why I know this is a random thing, but if you, um, and I often think about this because I'm getting older, you know, you know, when you look at all, all those societies where, um, these people live to be a hundred, all of them, every single one of them will say the most single important thing is not their diet or their, uh, you know, or their habits. It is their, um, contact with other people. Yes. All and of that the blue is, zones, it's community. That's right. It's community. And it is huge. In yoga, and yoga has lo- has long been a communal practice. I think that one of the things that um, make yoga less interesting was guru culture, which also mm. led to a lot of other predatory sexual blah, blah, blah. I don't have to go into that. But that's what really led to a lot of um, women in particular being diminished. And it took away the idea of communality. Mm. And it made the focus be on the guru, which was linear and paternal, and you do it this way, you do it right, you do it my way. There was no exploration for the student. So the students became too accommodating and too, um, uh, even their bodies became too compliant. Mm -hmm. And they lost that experience of using their own imagination. And you can only do that in relation to others, not to someone who's diminishing you. And so our practice is very communal. When you walk in the room, as you know, Our mats are facing each other. Everything, it is not a a paternal practice at all. It is all, and if you, um, if anyone comes to my Zoom classes, we're all talking to each other. We're all looking at each other. We're all exploring. It is a truly communal experience. That's how people stay connected to their own practice and to the community. And that's how people, that's how it stays fresh. And, and this is what I have found particularly because I love Zoom. This is what I found during the pandemic that the practice changes. And it only changes when it is communal and spherical that way, not when it's paternal and top down. Mm -hmm. And our practice has truly changed over the past two years. And that is because it's had to become um, more communal because we have had to find other ways to work together on Zoom. And, you know, there's all these things like, you know, spotlighting people and, um, you know, and, and, everybody coming up to the screen and looking at one person and looking at, you know, trying to, I don't know. I do. I just think that there's so many ways in which we've had to make it work for so many people where you couldn't just adjust people. You had to teach them how to self adjust. And so for that, they have to use their imagination. And so there's so many ways in which because of learning from each other, with each other, because of each other, in spite of each other, <laughs> the practice stays alive. And I think that's what keeps, at least our community, I can see that that's what keeps people um, uh, practicing. And it gives them some real motivation and they look forward to coming and they bring it into their life. And then it's not just about what's happening on the mat. It's about what's happening in their life. So I find that a huge, uh, a huge thing. 
It is huge. And it's one of the things that changed immediately in my own teaching. The longer that mm. I've studied with you, I don't teach in rows anymore. I haven't in a while. Mm. Um, and it was after I came to the studio, it completely changed the way that I teach because oh, I was so taught wonderful. to teach top down. You know, yeah. I was te- taught to put people in rows and to cue in a very specific way. And I don't anymore at all. I'm speaking right. to the bodies, that I'm speaking like, to the community. Yeah, and that's I'm like learning military. From them. Yeah. yeah, that's like military or school. And, you know, most people didn't thrive that well, no. you know, in school. And especially because, you know, a lot of people do yoga really well. They like to be in their bodies. And not necessarily are people who think really well. You know, Correct. people are more heady yeah. and esoteric is a different uh, game than a lot of people who come to yoga looking for something else. And I think that um, what they first find is something that feels familiar, but eventually... What they do find is more of themselves and a, a, a bigger um, a bigger idea of how to engage with their bodies, their mind, their soul, their breath in each other. Yes, and and it's. I was listening to a twenty hour training that you did a few months ago. I I can mm-hmm. never attend these things live because I'm always teaching, so I watch the <laughs> recordings and little tidbits. But uh-huh. you were speaking about maintaining and developing your antenna and your vision and your seeing. And how when students are in practices that are too top down, that they don't develop their antenna. And I likened it to if somebody drives you somewhere every single day and then you have to drive there by yourself, you don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. And what this practice that you and Naveen have developed so beautifully gives us is an opportunity to develop our own way to get there and to to use the maps and to make new routes and to explore ourselves in a way that is really empower, empowering instead of so hierarchical. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautifully said. You have such a, um, you have such a, a, an articulate way of expressing your own experience. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's really changed my teaching and I teach on Zoom as well. And I actually bought a projector and I project the Zoom students on the wall and I put the camera on the room so that everyone can be together wherever they are in the world. So all the students can see each other. So That's I can great. reference and spot like someone, as you said, and and we can have that really communal discussion. And I was also used to teaching classes that were very, and I still do this sometimes, themed and and a little more introspective, but I've also taken from you the conversation and the recognition that a community class is for reflection and growing and education. And then you get to go home and have a home practice and have an insight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, think that, that's beautiful. You know, Home practice is my favorite aspect of what this has all given me. You know, it's like, that's like, like a shorthand version of saying it gave me myself because Mm -hmm. that's really what you get. A home practice is using your own body as a sanctuary. So to go in and have an experience, but there has to be, there has to be ways to get in. And that's why we wrap ourselves in the breath and we magic square ourselves or we have a very set um, sequence of poses at a certain time of day, at a certain place in your house, so that, as you said at the very beginning of this, it becomes ritualized. Mm-hmm. And when you elevate something by, like, you know, making it smell good, and or if you can't quite get in, use music because you know, living with a soundtrack is so um, is so comforting and so soothing. If the soundtrack can't, if the soundtrack can't just be the breath, it can be whatever it is that's soothing to you that's going to allow you to go in. Eventually, the breath is what takes people into the imagination. But before yes. that, you know, but before that, some people find it very difficult to just go in. You know, it's like when people just, you know, find it very hard to just meditate. You know, but yeah. that is my meditation, going inside and staying at a plow for a half an hour and um, playing with my breath. Yes. And it's cultivating focus and attention and all of these things that are, mm-hmm. you know, fairly damaged in modern people or very damaged, depending on, you know, what you've been, been dealing with. And I love what you just said, because discipline and, uh, and the word disciple are related and no one wants to be a disciple of something shitty. Right. right. And so, <laughs> right. So when you make the experience something really sweet and make it smell good, as you said, then you have a desire to be a disciple, a disciple and to follow it, the practice. Right. Also, I think that, you know, if you use your senses, there's so many ways to make it a pleasure. Yeah. You know, if you find, you know, 
And, you know, simple things like, you know, use your favorite mat, do it near a window, find uh, your relationship to nature, do it, do ways in which it's going to open up your third eye to find your, your pineal gland and really know that you are, um, uh, that you're feeding yourself with this practice. So you want to use all of the senses in order to help you go in because it's just another tool that is accessible to all of us in order to make our bodies our allies. Yeah. I would love to speak with you a little bit about our emotions and our feelings because I know Mm -hmm. students that are new to Katona practice, they hear us saying all the time, you know, that you don't do things to your feelings and, and whatnot. And I know the very first time that I came and was listening to the dialogue around feelings, I got all self-righteous and, you know, triggered mm-hmm. inside. And I was like, feelings are important. Feelings right. are really important. And right. they are important, right? Mm-hmm. But what I've gotten from the practice in a huge way is to learn to treat my problems like an object, to problem solve and to invite some of that stoicism of getting a little bit of distance from some of those immediate spikes in chemistry to, you know, grow into deeper alignment with truth of great nature and and to see things from a new light. But I know that sometimes students get a little, I've seen it in my own classes, flustered when you start saying things like, don't do things to your feelings. So could you speak a little bit about emotionality and the role of feelings in yeah. this model? Yeah, well, in a very simplistic way, you don't measure the distance between your feet with your feelings. You use measure. You don't hang a picture with your feelings. You use a level tool. You, um, you want to be able to use, um, tools to your advantage so that your feelings don't flood. So, for example, um, you just mentioned that feelings are like, can be like a chemical spike. And your chemistry is really shifted when you're, for example, when the asana pose really fits. When your armpit fits your knee and you're perfectly folded in your hip, your feeling of discomfort will change to be able to let go of tension. Feelings will change when, um, when uh, oppositions of any kind are reconciled. So when, um, if I walk in a room and I am completely agitated and I think I did a terrible job and my heart is beating and then you tell me, you did a great job, my feelings change immediately. Mm. Like your feelings will change as soon as something is reconciled. And by reconciliation, I mean when you fold a fold in an origami fold and it's your body and you fold and make good contact, the feelings will change. Feelings change. Chemistry shifts when things work, when things fit. So when, when chemistry moves with uh, the effort to have good technique. So when I'm trying to, uh, getting frustrated with my knitting and I can't make it right and it's all messy, And I work and work and work until the technique is so clean that I made a beautiful sweater because I worked on my technique, not my feelings. My feelings change. Feelings change when things work. When when people are polarized, I say this and you say that, and I just can repeat, repeat my point of view and you repeat your position. Feelings don't change. They get more aggravated. As soon as uh, we have a mediation, a third person come in and I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell you and this third person my position. And then you're going to tell that person and me your position. All of a sudden we have a whole bigger, we have a whole big narrative. We have a whole big story. It's not polarized. I said this, you said this, I said this, you said this. Once we have a trinity, once we have a third thing, we have a big narrative and all of a sudden you can hear why I did the thing I did, why I did it, how I did it, what I was feeling, blah, blah, blah. You hear my whole story. And all of a sudden you realize I'm not your enemy. Mm. I'm just trying to survive myself. Your feelings will change. So feelings, feelings are not the measure of themselves and they don't regulate themselves. You have to use something bigger than a feeling because feelings have all of our damage in it, all of our personal triggers, all of our history, all of our unconscious. 
because that's what a feeling is. It's part of, it's just like triggered from first nature. Mm. But once you use more than your first nature with anything, you have a bigger canvas to play with. You have more possibilities. You have a bigger vision of the whole thing. Immediately, your feelings will change. So you don't try and change the feeling. You try and open up the field of awareness or open up the field of contact or open up the field of possibilities of what that could be. So I, now I, I love feelings. I, you know, psychoanalysis, my hobby, that's like my absolute yes, yes, yes. So I, I honor feelings. I love feelings. But I also know that a real exploration of feelings is different than just, I have this feeling, it's making me uncomfortable, so something must be wrong with it. I know the difference. I know that my feeling is about me having a reaction to something that's all about me, all about my history, all about my um, a habit repeating itself. But as soon as I open up the field of exploration, it's more than that. And then my feelings um, have the freedom actually to shift. So feelings will grow. Feelings will change when things work out for people. All is forgiven when you get what you want. <laughs> It's right, true. You, you, you know, you grow up and you, you know, and you are uh, mad at somebody and you think something happened a certain way and you hang on to that, you hang on to that uh, trauma and it triggers every other trauma similar to it as you move through life. The minute you go back and reconcile that, all is forgiven. Because first of all, unless people are psychotic, n- nobody does it wrong on purpose and nobody mm-hmm. usually means to hurt you. They're just trying the best they can and people are very you know, messy survival skills. Yes. And if you're not taught communication skills when you're young, it's very difficult not to be run by the feelings that come up in your body, which is primitive. It's very primitive. And it's total survival instinct. Right. That's so beautifully said. I with In my own life, because I was a very emotional person and I've mm-hmm. had a lot of trauma, I've lost a spouse in a very traumatic way and whatever, mm-hmm. we don't need to go there, but there's been a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I've taken from this is I used to look at my mistakes and my hard emotions as I'm bad and I'm doing it wrong. I'm not trying mm-hmm. hard enough. And what this practice has given me now when I see something off I look at myself and I smile and I'm like, you're just missing a technique. And I look at other people that way and my compassion has grown a thousand fold because when someone's being a real asshole, I'm like, they lack a tech, <laughs> they're lacking a technique right now. They don't know how to communicate their pain to me. Exactly. And it allows me to really step into my compassion and approach it differently because I know they're not fighting me. That's right. And that has come just from this practice, you know, not just from this practice. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the difference between like, you know, hope or luck and skill is technique. Yeah. And, you know, we, I can't say enough about technique and, you know, that's why you play music with a musical score until you can throw it out and start improvising. Or, you know, you start with a recipe until you can throw out and improvise. Or, you know, once your imagination can come into that dialogue with the recipe, ah, you're golden. But at first, use a recipe, learn how to use the technique so that you're not just using your first nature. Use a second nature, which is from the, from, with, use your solar nature, which is from the word scholastic. Learn something that has skill. Learn something that has um, uh, a, real, uh, uh, a real core of um, uh of a grid. So use a grid because it's better than a feeling. Yes. And like you said, we have to do this in reflection with other people because it's the nature of deception to not know you're deceived, right? So you have to be Mm. in community with a reflection back to you. It's like, I do Brazilian jujitsu and just last week we were working on a really basic technique that you learn when you're a brand new student And my coach, who's a second degree black belt, was saying that students give up this technique as soon as they start to spar because they think it doesn't work. And it Mm. does work. It's just that they're missing the technique. Like they haven't refined the technique. And once Mm -hmm. you, when you own the technique, it works on anyone, no matter how big they are. And I was very skeptical. And then we spent two weeks refining this little technique. And now I've been landing it again and again and again in my sparring. 
And right. I, it's something oh, that for the great. last year and a half, I quit doing because I was like, that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. I, and it's I used that to, reminder um, of repetition, right? Yes. The more, yes. The more you repeat good technique, the more you develop the capacity to have an insight. Yeah. As we say it. Yeah. So that and first, that's how you, know, you unravel habit, right? Where I was, that was going to be my next question: is how do you implement new habits and erase the old ones or undo? Well, the knots? you don't. You don't get rid of old ones. You cultivate new ones, mm. and they will override the old ones just by using the new ones, because you won't need the compensatory skill of a habit. And a habit is something that is unconscious. And so, what you really want to do is just use your solar nature, that capacity to really learn something. So, you know, you, you have the potential to learn how to read and you sound out letters and then you really slowly start to read sentences because you have a solar nature to be able to be educated. But eventually you use your stellar nature, which is then to read stories. And so after you're reading stories, the way that you were doing it at first, doesn't matter that it didn't work anymore. And you can let that go and you will. Or, you know, when you learn how to ride a bike and you're only using training wheels, well, after a while, what you really want to do is learn how to um, steer, pedal, look around, steer, pedal, look around and keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going until you're not just learning how to ride a bike, you are using it for transportation. Mm. And then you've cultivated what we refer to as Wu Wei, effortless effort. And then whatever habit you had, it went by the wayside a long time ago because first you have your lunar nature, which is the potential to ride a bike, your solar nature, which is you learn to ride a bike and your stellar nature, which is it's my transportation. Mm -hmm. And then you're not thinking about the potential or how you learned it. It's just, you own it. And then you come to your fourth nature, which is really uh, your humanity and how you show somebody else how to ride or you know, the, the bike you, you, um, you chose or the horizon of the next game of like what you're going to do with your bike riding. That's so, so, so good. Yeah. And that's really how you learn anything. And I love the way that you talk about first nature as being potential because so many esoteric traditions talk about our first nature so negatively. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of religious no, traditions what and what, well, a lot of religious traditions, you know, born in sin, for example, oh, or uh -huh. do you know what I'm oh, saying? Like yeah. there's this well, idea that we need to like beat the something right. out of us and you're yes, like, no, it's your I potential. Do, yes. But I think that's a cultural thing. I think, first of all, a lot of the things that we learned from other lineages have a, a translation that's very clunky. Yes. And it becomes like a booby prize because- um, sin, the word sin just means without. So yeah. when you do something without grace or without God or without thought or without nature, it's like, oh my God, well, of course it's going to be bad, right? But it's not bad. Like you're bad. It yeah. won't work. You won't get to where you want to go. And I think that Westerners, because Westerners are so linear, is that it becomes this polarizing thing of good or bad instead of there's something you don't know. And then mm. we're going to teach it to you. And then you're going to own it for yourself. And then you're going to go teach it to somebody else and, you know, up the game with your humanity. So again, it's like what you said just a few minutes ago, where there's, when someone errs, it is just a technique that they don't know yet. Yeah. And that is more true than that we're born bad. At. I don't think, you know, I think that it's the way that people um, translate some of these words into English, like all, uh, like all life is suffering. I don't yeah. think that they meant that. They probably meant it's agitating and it's agitating to learn new things. It's agitating to grow and it's agitating to develop um, a new part of yourself that was previously unknown because it's a risk. Yes. And so it's agitating, but it, it's not necessarily suffering. You know, I think that, um, so I think that we have to, you know, so, and, you know, and clearly you love language because you're so articulate and so fluent with your words. And I so appreciate talking to you for that reason. And, you know, I think that when people are, are, um, 
Uh, and, and Elaine is the same. She speaks so beautifully. She's so well educated. She's got so much grace when she speaks. Yes. And so these are people who can really um, explore an idea instead of having to have the right answer. Right. So that it's and you're never so right polar. about the translation thing. You're so right about that. I actually, you'll love this. Um, I know you don't do a lot of Sanskrit study, but I have. And dukkha, the word for suffering, is mm-hmm. a broken axle in a wheel. Mm, right. Which I Love know, that. like you've yeah. been saying, you know, you need to have all your spokes <laughs> spoken for in your wheel. And I've been yes. saying that in class a lot. And <laughs> I think about like suffering as you're missing one of your spokes. Right. Right. And that's not, doesn't make you a bad person. No. It makes you missing one of your spokes. Yes. And, the, you know, the spokes are like uh, the spokes of your personal wheels, like your finances, your physical practice, your friends, your career, your hobbies, your children, your, you know, it's like all those are spokes of your wheel. Like, oh my goodness, how could one be bad? Yeah. Yeah. And it is so much translation. I, one of the words there's a, I've actually spent quite a bit of time with the Greek and um, the Hebrew looking at some of these sacred texts. And for example, the word, there's this word to know, and it says no in English throughout the entire Bible and through, you know, English translations of the Torah, but there's so many different words for to know. Like one Mm -hmm. of them is an intimate experience and one of them is intellectual knowledge. And we just write the word no. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Right. And it's so simplified and we take these complex things and reduce them again, because we think it makes the world more manageable, but it, uh, it robs it of its color and it's just flattens everything. everything. Yeah. There has to be an overlaying of ideas in order to really live a reflective life. There has to be more than one thing that, um, kind of hits the idea So, or forms an idea or explores an idea, there has to be more than one thing so that you have like a portal for your own insight to come through. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that um, that's why people have to know more than just yoga. People have to do more than just know um, one thing. They have to be able to know a language, know how to hit, you know, know how to uh, knit, know how to read, know how to drive, know how to have an intimate relationship, know how to fight, you know, know how to explore a word because all of those things have their own metaf- metaphorical reality that you can explore, yes. which is how, that's why I like the body is a house, the body is a car, the body is a boat, you know, all the different ways that we can explore the body. And, you know, people think that the, uh, that, that English is so difficult because there's so many ways to say so many things, but that is also what makes all of it so exciting. And so it makes the body exciting because you can see the body as a boat. You can see the body as a house. You can see the body as a car. There's so many ways to explore it as a container, as a radio. We have lots of ways to explore the body. And that is because, you know, some people can, uh, some people can enter into a metaphor because they know something about things and then it becomes universal to them. And then we have a common reference. So a metaphor has to be something that's universal. It has to be something that has a reference really quick. It has to be something you can visualize really quickly. And that takes it out of the realm of something that's flat or concrete. And it takes it into the imagination. And then um, it's limitless. And that's why you don't have to be a, uh, uh, a bendy, uh, you know, a bendy white person to do yoga. Right. One of the first things you ever said to me when I came into the studio was it takes a long time to build a soul. And if you want to get, be a good teacher, go learn a lot of skills, take a cooking class, go to an art museum, read a poem. Right. And I say it, I quote you to my students in teacher training all the time. I'm like, I can tell you about the anatomy of the body and how to you know, teach people how to communicate with bodies, but to put the sauce on it and make it something really nourishing, you have to build techniques in your life and bring it into the practice. Exactly. Yeah. It's really about your humanity, much less than about your body. The body is primitive. Anybody can learn the physical practice, but can you learn the physical practice with real fluency that, you know, with real levity rather than doing poses? That changes a life. And the myth and the metaphor, Dr. Douglas Brooks, who's one of my teachers and sat on my doctoral committee, 
uh, he's a mythologist and an Indian specialist, Indianologist, and he teaches a lot of myth. And he always says that myth is a self-conscious lie told in service of deeper truth and that it puts something more up for grabs than candor, which can be cruel. Mm, Yeah. And that's what I feel from you when I listen to you teach. And there's so much metaphor. It's weaving a narrative and a story. And you can say things that otherwise might, you know, be hurtful to someone, but it's impersonal when you use metaphor. And so you can talk about, you know, the body is a house and we all know what's in a basement without anyone having to feel so attached to what's being said. Right. Right. It also, um, you know, makes the teacher safe because you're not talking about someone's pelvis. Everybody is in their pelvis. You can give them a different way of thinking about it. So it doesn't have the triggering connotations of um, my private parts, that it's more than that, that we have reduced our, you know, with all of our, our taboos, um, people don't have their hips, people don't have their lower bodies, so people don't have their depths. And so it's at such a disservice that there's so much taboo and so much taboo language and so much taboo touching, so much um, uh, taboo thinking and communicating about one's primal nature. That it's not primitive, it's primal. So, you know, I think so, you know, language is so important and metaphor makes it universal and not personal. We are all invested in the personal. It is personal to all of us. But when you're teaching, once you, the more universal you are, the more individual students can make references to themselves. Yes. And that's why you can teach a cross-cultural, multicultural room. I've yeah. always had students who English was their second language, but I've noticed um, mm-hmm. since my time studying Katona and so in depth the last couple of years, especially since the pandemic started, because I had nothing else to do but sit in my room yeah. and study and do my yeah. practice, uh, that I'm communicating so much better with all of my students in France and Germany and Greece and Israel and all these places because I'm not, I'm not so linear and I'm not speaking right. so linearly and I'm using so much metaphor now and everyone has to cook food. Yes, that's right. It's really, really potent and really powerful. And what you said also about community, we're in a generation where we're more isolated than we've ever been. There's a study that's done every, I think, 20 years about mm-hmm. people having someone to call with their problems. And every like 10 or 20 years when they do the study, the amount of people that say they have no one to talk to doubles. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, oh, that's so, so sad. In an yeah. area, in an era when we're more connected than ever, people are experiencing such profound separation and pain mm-hmm. and isolation. And this practice is so hopeful in that way of bringing because it's for everyone. Yeah. Well, I think the good thing about this period we're in is that um, we're getting into a more um, a more we're coming out of like an earthy phase of like uh, everything is self cultivation and self care and blah blah. I think that this is taking us into a phase of uh, a more metal phase where we are um, re-evaluating what's important to us. Mm-hmm. All about values and reflection and, you know, with all these people like leaving the workplace or starting their own business or starting a practice. I met so many people who started yoga during the pandemic. Yep. And so, you know, I think that this phase that we're moving into is going to be a really interesting one for our culture. I agree. I've Elaine and I were actually just speaking about this, about practices, altruism, and how there was this phase in, you know, for lack of a better word, the new age movement where everything was all about me. Like you just yeah. said, like all of our practices were so self-focused. Yeah. And there's now this remembrance of something that was common in the 60s of, you know, knowing that there had to be a direct line between personal well-being and practice and and global well-being. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a real movement happening again of a shaking of people going like, okay, yes, my personal well-being, but I also need to tend to the forest and have a That's direct right. line back outwards to civil service and to engage civil engagement. Right. And that is so metal. Metal is like everything it's me and then there's everything it's not me. Mm. That, you know, that it is, you know, the big, you know, big heaven, big sky, big vision in terms of what is important to me. 
So I, you know, I think that a more a global awareness, while uh, while not losing self cultivation, is what is going to give all of us um, a reach into humanity and not just uh, a focus on how to get ahead. Right. Well, and we have to be tending to ourselves and taking care of our physical bodies if we want to be of any kind of service. I let right. a few of my practices slide for just five days last week, only five days. I was too busy, quotation marks, and I didn't do my meditation. I didn't do my breath work practice. And I watched my creativity plummet. I watched mm. the way I was teaching and my service start to dwindle. And mm-hmm. it was a really profound moment because I haven't let my practices slide like that in a long time. And it happens so quick. It's like Mm. you said uh, in a lecture I was listening to recently, and I'm a piano player, so I resonated with Mm. this deeply. Every time the pianist gets on the stage, you have to play your scales. You don't start with Chopin. Right. And so this daily thing of like, how do we tend to ourselves in any given day to make sure that we can be of service and that we can uh, show up for our families and our students and whatever it is that we need to have in our sphere of influence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so true. That's beautiful. So you're in a phase of your life where you can take a lot more time with your practice. I know uh, Elena was just saying as well, she's at a point where her child is older and your children are grown. So you Mm -hmm. can spend 30 minutes in a plow. What advice would you have? Because we've just got a few minutes left Mm -hmm. to people that are raising small children and running companies and whatnot about Mm -hmm. how to cultivate a practice. Because I hear students say a lot that they don't have time or they feel like if they can't do 90 minutes, there's no point. Mm -hmm. And while you and I know that's not true, I'd love to hear your wisdom about how to cultivate that. Yeah. You know, first of all, you have to be so patient and kind to yourself and that, you know, Uh, Kind of, you know, uh, as the face readers say, like, you know, every decade is a yin or a yang decade. Mm. And, you know, when you're in your 20s, what you really want to do is like, you know, be a little chaotic, go everywhere, you know, change careers 12 times, change relationships a million times, travel, see where you want to be, see where you want to go, see where you're never going to go. You know, like uh, shift things, Uh, just really know that that is what the 20s is supposed to be. It's so like yang right? You're leaving home for the first time. So for that, it's sort of like, you know, um, you know, give yourself, you know, free reign to explore. In the 30s, it's more yin. And it's like sort of recovering from the 20s and figuring out maybe the first, uh, the first, the first glimmers of, I think I want to pursue this, or I think I want this kind of person, not that kind of person, or I think I might want to have kids or maybe in the future, but right now I'm going to, you know, just focus on myself. So it's a real yin uh, time of going in. The, the 40s are where you really cultivate your career. You really feel your own power. Mm. And um, this is also, you know, a lot of people have children around this time. And so you be really kind to yourself and you figure out how you can be powerful at home, powerful in the world, and, you know, try and find... Uh, not a balance, but your own self-expression with how to make yourself um, uh, regulated and healthy. The 50s are a yin decade, and that is when everything gets reviewed. Everything gets re- reestablished, reviewed, reworked, recultivated. That's the 50s. It's like, oh, gosh, what does this map look like now? What should it look like? Where is it uncomfortable? How do I do my life differently? And then um, the 60s are yin and yang. And that is, you know, I can only say that it was true for me. All of these were true for me. And this is um, coming from Chinese medicine, but I really love um, the organization of the decades because, you know, in the 20s, it's really you're coming out of using the information from your ancestry and your childhood. In your 30s, your eyes are open, but you're, you know, and your heart is open and you're um, learning what's inside of you. Like truly, who, what am I made of? In your 40s, it's your power in the world. So it's like you're, it's a mountainous decade. It's like, you know, the uh, hills and the valleys and the plains and the, and the, and the fields. It's like, whoa, I'm going to explore all this terrain. And in the fifties, it's, um, the language of relationships becomes, uh, more accessible. 
to everybody. Men lose their ter- testosterone and become a little softer. Women um, get more masculine and get on boards and start to run companies and, you know, do things like that and, and just reestablish who they are. And, you know, I just find that um, if people really are patient and don't think that where you are now is where you'll always be because time uh, is such a beautiful element to add to whatever it is you're doing or you're thinking or you think that you're stuck. Mm-hmm. Always know that you're never stuck because nature will always give you a way out. Just check out great nature. Check out the seasons and figure out what season am I in with this idea or this project or this relationship and see where it is that actually you're in a process and you always are. You're always in a season. You're always in a certain moment. So there's always a, um, there's always going to be hills and valleys because that's the nature of our bodies and it's the, na- the nature of terrain. That's the nature of nature. If you just follow nature, you can't go wrong. Also, keep yourself expressive to yourself. That's why, you know, writing morning pages has been a real, um, for, I don't know, 40 years now. I just fill three pages every day. And I, sometimes I don't do it for weeks, but I always come back to it. And you'll hear your own thoughts and you'll get somewhere. If you really fill three pages, you will get to an insight and use other people so that your self inquiry doesn't get, um, doesn't come back to you. It goes out to another person so that you can always be in reflection to other people. So I just, you know, I, I just have certain things that I know work. And one of them is the, you know, I have such an awe for nature and awe for time. And I just keep doing my practice and it has gotten better and better and better and better. When I started, I could barely touch my toes. And now I can put my foot around my neck and I can do, there's no pose that I can't do now. But, you know, it took time. I I am not by nature fluent. So even in the physicality, but I also get to see that the more fluent you get in your body, the more fluent you get in your mind. Yeah. That's really beautiful. I love the explanation of the decades. I just turned 40 and I feel that. Like yeah. what, how oh, you, you described the right. 20s and the 30s. I'm like, that is accurate. And what you said yeah. about the 40s, I can already see it. Now, if you are transitioning to your 40s, it's like a critical transition. And you probably started at 38 and it can go up to like 44. Yep. But that is still considered a transition and you'll feel like you're coming into your own in some way. I do feel that already. And I have the last couple of years. That's very accurate. And what you're describing about the 60s, I'm watching my parents go through that transition and it's wonderful. Yeah. It makes me excited. I don't fear aging in any way. Elena is such a model to me of healthy, graceful aging as are you, as is Naveen. Like it's so beautiful to watch because we used to have this idea that aging had to mean losing your mind and getting decrepit and You know, I look at people like you and Naveen and Elena. I mean, I know Elena's only 50, but I just see this grace and elegance and fluidity and the intelligence and, you know, the codifying of seasonality and all these things. And it's so cool to watch and it makes me so hopeful. Mm -hmm. And it should, you know, unfortunately in our culture, it's terrible to get old, but actually if you're, if you're really living your path and your um, spirit is rising, it's a it's a beautiful thing. I love mentoring young people, and uh, I moved this year um, to a new place. And like, I just love the change. It gave me a whole new perspective, and um, you know, it's such a great experience to um, have to adapt to a new everything. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just living your life and staying um, awake and aware, and really having something besides yourself. So, you know, learning techniques and sticking with great nature and having some practices that are consistent and that, that are growing, you know, just like, you know, I, I enjoy every decade Yeah, and life is awesome. I agree. That's so beautifully Mm -hmm. said. I think that's a lovely place to wrap up. I am so grateful for your time today. It's such an honor to get to talk to you. I've been watching recordings the last few months. I haven't been to the studio in quite a while, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's been really sweet to catch up with you. 
Uh, there will be information in the show notes of how you can take class with Abby and her team. They're all wonderful. She has a digital studio. If you can't attend class live on Zoom, I use it all the time. I will put the links to all of that. If you're a yoga teacher or a practitioner, she also offers regular trainings at the studio on every topic you can imagine. I've seen feng shui classes, I think, face reading, mm-hmm. body reading, yoga, um, so that you can really develop your personal techniques. So all of that will be in the show notes for you so you can find Abby. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Selena. Thank you. This was such a wonderful conversation. I would love to have you back again soon. Thank you. Thank you.